Greetings all, uh, welcome once again to Heinz webinar or podcast, uh, take your pick, a uh, regular deep dive into the weird and wonderful world of strata and management rights in Queensland. Hello, uh, my name is Chris Hines, Director of Strata Solve, that's stratasolve.com.au. Uh, and as always, I'm joined by Frank Higginson, partner at Heinz Legal, the premier provider of legal advice to the strata industry in Queensland. Frank, how are you? I'm good, Chris. Mm -hmm. You can tell I'm a little bit croaky because I finally, mm -hmm. after two and a half years of ducking and weaving the coronavirus, it finally got me last weekend. Ah, uh, gosh. So in theory, I'm still in isolation, but this is the joy of technology because we can do <laughs> these things without uh, passing on diseases. Mm, we can, we can. Just, um, gosh, it's remarkable, isn't it? Two and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> Must be Gets us very good the end, mate. Your uh, turn at some stage. Oh no, I've had my turn. Um, oh, I've had my turn. Yeah, I've had my turn. Um, anything else in the world of Strata this week, Frank? Of note? Uh, not really, other than it's been an effective week for getting work done. Because when you can't actually go out and talk and see people, <laughs> it means you're sitting at your desk doing nothing else. So um, hopefully, there's lots of satisfied clients out there from the uh, production volume this week. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the same. And I suppose um, we'll say there seems to be lots of coronavirus lurking around everywhere. Hasn't quite gone that away. Has been, has it, in a sense. Mm, no, no, yeah. No, no. No. Then you add influenza away and monkeypox and away we go. Happy days. <laughs> um, enough of that, though. Um, look, just a bit, uh, for a bit of housekeeping. For those listening in live on our YouTube channel, you can post your questions in the chat. And Frank and I absolutely uh, welcome that. Uh, keeps us on our toes, nice and engaged. We try and get to as many of those as we possibly can throughout. Uh, for those listening in later on in the podcast, while you're out walking the dog or washing the dishes or walking the dog while washing the dishes, uh, you can find all the notes and links that we refer to at heinzlegal.com.au, H-Y-N-E-S legal.com.au. This week, uh, Frank, Bit of show and tell, isn't it? We are testing new technology, everyone. So <laughs> look out. <laughs> to be fair, it's actually new, uh, but our engagement with it is somewhat new, I think. But yeah, fair enough. Yeah. This week, uh, how to read your CMS. Um, we've talked a lot. I, I don't think a week goes by without us talking about a CMS in some form or another, Frank, does it? No, not at all every single week and there's some part of it that you oh, no there wouldn't be hand on heart mm. almost every single day there's probably not a single thing we'd touch that comes across our desk that doesn't involve some reference to a cms somewhere yeah so you know we've spoken spoken a lot about i suppose what's in them so today uh take myself back to uh my child's first year of uh, school we're gonna do a show and share with a bit of luck so i'll be doing um a lot of the talking and I suppose I've got to be a little bit like Jim Maxwell in the uh, test cricket where you describe something for those of you watching the TV it's fine but for those of you not watching the TV and listening I'm gonna to have to do my best describing of what it is that I'm talking about which maybe you can check up on afterwards but we'll see how we go and actually when you think about it Frank that's while that on one level that might sound a bit convoluted it's actually a good thing because CMS is uh, reading a CMS is the sort of thing that you might have to go back to more than once uh, and so it actually assists in going, keep going back to aid your understanding anyway, I would have thought. Before we do the visual, uh, let's just get a few things out of the way first. Maybe the most obvious one. What is a CMS anyway, Frank? What does it mean? A community management statement. So before the BCCM Act arrived in 1997, um, it was interesting that that to decide or to determine what rules basically bound the body corporate. Like all the information that we have in a CMS is in one document. And when you change any part of a CMS, you lodge the whole thing again mm -hmm. so that you know that the very last registered CMS is the ultimate, ultimate document that has all of the stuff that we're talking about today that no matter what, you don't need to go any further. Under the old regime, there used to be, you'd lodge your survey plan. Your survey plan would actually have your entitlements. So to understand what your entitlements were, you'd have to go to that and get a copy of the right. survey plan. And the bylaws 
would then be registered separately. So for anyone who's listening that's still in a scheme regulated by the Building Units and Group Titles Act, you're still in that old regime. So for you to understand what your entitlements are, you need to get a plan and you need to go and get a copy of the historical common property title search, which has the bylaws registered in 1976 and the amendment in 78 and the new three bylaws in 84 and so on. And you need to get copies of all of those and put them all together to determine what your bylaws are. CMS has did away with all that. Mm -hmm. There's the document, has it all in it, that's it. So in effect, Frank, the CMS, it gives life to your strata scheme. It, it is it is the, the the progenitor. That's a good the one. The constitution <laughs> in yep, some yeah, way, yeah. some way, shape, or form. Yep, absolutely. The the living Bible. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I, I like that. The constitution. A lot of people sort of compare an association to a body corporate. So calling it constitution makes a good one. Uh, um, and as we'll find out today, our CMS is composed of a few different parts, and we'll hopefully go through all of those. Before we get into that, very quickly, why should anyone care, Frank? It's just another document, isn't it? Absolutely, but it's a document that you're bound by, by virtue of your ownership of that piece of real estate that is that strata lot. So Hmm. like it or not, having read the document or not, or understood it or not, it is binding on you. And there is no way for it to be unbinding on you unless you sell. So it it sets out, yeah, it's a commitment that you cannot break. You can't divorce it. It's done. It's your your Magna Carta. Um, (laughs) um, The main thing that people would refer to, Frank, and the CMS is bylaws, isn't it? Absolutely. And to be fair, that probably is um, the biggest part of it. Mm. Although there's some, uh, yeah, I'd say the entitlements are the other very large part of ACMS. Um, mm. And the one we've got today that we'll sh- screen share on um, is just one we picked at random. It's got no particular meaning other than all mm. of the parts that have been completed. So when I'm talking to <laughs> what they are, here's what I mean by this. Here's what I mean yeah. by this. And this is what goes here and why. So, um, yeah, you can't escape it, I think. So So therefore, it's one of those things. You want to make it a known, known. You want it to be something you can understand and you know what the rules are because they are the rules. Uh, and and for, just to clarify, for owners, uh, it outlines your property rights and obligations. And for committees, it does the same thing. Uh, and it also provides you with your boundaries, uh, metaphorical and literal boundaries, which is super important. Okay, let's go through it. Uh, and you will be seeing us. There we are. Um, uh, no. It's got you, Annie. Hang on. Here we go. So the first part of this um, is the general request. So that document is actually not part of the CMS itself, but it's it's one that is on every CMS because these documents are all registered in the Queensland Lands Office. So to register a document in the the titles office, lands office, you need to have a request to do so. So this is gonna be on the front page of almost every CMS you get. Um, The same as every titles office document has this general format. So in a sense, this doesn't mean all that much other than this is the request from someone, usually signed by a lawyer, to register the document that's attached to it. So the CMS itself starts on the next page. And that's yep. the really important place to start. And Frank, we should say that we, we've done our best to try and get that CMS as large as possible as we can for the purposes of this exercise. Um, hopefully, if you're watching this at home, um, you might be able to pop it on to a, um, a very big screen for ease of readability, as you were, Frank. Cool. So the next page is where we actually get into the body corporate itself. So. The first page of every CMS, and you'll see at the very top, we've got the first slash new. So the starting point is, is this a subsequent CMS or is it the very first one? So the very first one might be lodged or will be lodged by the developer or the person that created the body corporate. Every CMS after that is called a new one because it is a new one. And you'll see at the top right-hand corner then, just beside the 51542, there's the So what's that number, Frank? That is the CTS number. Right. So oh, hang every on. CTS CMS, number. CTS, we're getting a bit confusing Sorry, here. Sorry, community. Like we got CMS and CTS. Apologies. I'll, I'll slow down for a second. <laughs> so a community management statement is this document. 
everybody corporate in Queensland is a community title scheme. And every one of those has its own actual uh, CTS number. So this body corporate is 51542. So um, we don't refer to them by numbers other than probably on seals and in paperwork and that sort of thing. It's still known as Irons Towers or Higgins yep. Flats or whatever it might be. Whereas yep. if you go to Southern states, New South Wales particularly, down there, their plans aren't so much known by the name of the buildings, but by the SP numbers, survey plan uh, numbers. Okay, that's On the way around. Yeah, that. so I think um, the names are probably a better way to do it up here, but maybe I'm mm. a Queenslander and just constructed that way. So yeah. your CTS number won't ever change. That's going to be it. Um, and when we walk through the first page of this document, we've got the name of the body corporate there as number one. Um, we've got the regulation module that applies to it as number two. Now, again, in Queensland, we've got that unique model where we've got a headpiece of legislation called the BCCM Act. And then we've got a range of different modules that have potentially a bunch of different rules that a body corporate can choose to adopt. So we have commercial module, which obviously not obviously, but is for buildings that are largely commercial in nature, retail lots, industrial lots, shops, and all that sort of stuff, yep. offices. Uh, we've got small schemes, six lots or less. We've got two lots. So if you've got a duplex, there's a specific module for duplex lots that really um, cuts the daylights out of compliance. Effectively, almost allows you to do whatever you want to do as agreed with your other owner. And then the further up the tree you go, you've got standard module, which is, yep. I suppose, in a sense, Chris, the default module that applies to everybody corporate unless you choose something else. Yeah. Um, and it's probably the one with the greatest degree of compliance and in a sense of protection for consumers. Um, and then you've got the accommodation module, which in theory is designed largely for lots at schemes that are predominantly investor owned. Yeah. As much as over time, different modules, you know, you might pick a module today and 10 years later, the same um, rationale for choosing that module no longer applies because of the nature of the occupants of the scheme has changed. But again, we're yep. not talking about that today. In terms of what's important to CMS, number two, that's the module this building is regulated by. Okay. Um, name of the body corporate, quite simple, you know, name of body corporate, now CTS number. Um, now, this is going to be interesting. Number three there, the scheme land. One of the things that, as Chris was saying, CMS does is it identifies all of the property that forms part of this body corporate. So you don't need to guess whether you're part of a body corporate or not. You can go and look up your lot on plan number, lot 52 on SP, whatever it might be. Um, and if you're in there, then you're part of this. And that will also show up on the plan. Sorry, Frank, what does SP mean? Survey plan. Sorry, right. Chris. No, that's good. Acronym city here today. <laughs> um, so, sorry, that was just a cough, COVID cough. Um, so all of the lots that form part of this body corporate are going to be part of this CMS. So if you only had a couple of them, you'd put them there in that item three. Um, if you've got a lot of them, like this body corporate does, you put it in a separate schedule. Uh, next bit, uh, really the execution component. So number five there is if the original owner is lodging this, the developer, the name, their name and address. Um, if there's a survey plan that's lodged with a CMS to change some part of the lots or descriptions or whatever it might be, um, it's noted there in that item six. Because what can sometimes happen is you might have a CMS that has pluck a figure eight lots and right. one of those lots is capable of subdivision. So what will happen to, to subdivide that eighth lot, you need to lodge a survey plan with a new CMS because what happens at the same time is the body corporate will go from eight lots to nine lots. So you'll turn that eighth lot into two separate lots and you'll need a survey plan that creates the new eighth lot and the new ninth lot. Right. And that gets lodged with this document. And that also then gets recorded in here. So. Again, there's a bit of a combo with that one where you might want to see the survey plan as well as um, the CMS itself, but these are the things you look for. Um, the next bit down there is whether um, local authority approval is required because of course, before you can subdivide land, um, it's regulated by councils, 
local councils. Councils need to sign CMSs. So if this was a first CMS, you would see um, the local government having signed that there. Right. In some form of delegated authority. If okay. you're doing a subsequent CMS, like a new CMS, like this one is, and subject to what you're doing with it, if you are simply changing a bylaw, you wouldn't need to have local government approval on that because they don't need to consent to changes of bylaws. They just need to consent to changes of really property boundaries and that sort of stuff. And then, of course, um, we still have common seals. So the body corporate seal needs to be there and be legible. And it needs to be, that seal needs to be affixed in accordance with whatever the um, authorization of the body corporate is. So the fault position, it's the chair, personal secretary and one other body corporate member, although bodies corporate and general meeting can make different decisions about how the seal's used and who can sign it. So that's the first page. And there's probably not a whole lot of important information on that. Probably the module's the biggest thing on that one. Yeah. Um, and it would be the properties. But the next one is, the next page is where we start to get into some of the detail. And here we're going to hop into Schedule A. Because I was mentioning before that all of the property that forms part of the body corporate needs to be listed. And here's where they've done it in this one because it's obviously a bigger body corporate. So we've, the first thing is the common property. So the common property itself has a lot. And believe it or not, that's lot zero on SP, whatever it might be, the survey plan. So, um, and, and here you go, even here, how old school I am, because we've now um, completely, I wouldn't say automated, uh, it's all in the machine, all of our titles, office systems and procedures. So the whole um, county and parish now don't form part of CMSs and title descriptions anymore. We've got a lot on plan and we've got a title reference number. But lot zero is the common property title, and that's obviously part of the scheme. And after that, we've got all of our different lot on plan descriptions and their respective title references. And that rolls through the whole way. Mm -hmm. So every, and the next page will continue that until all of the property that's part of that body corporate is described. So that's really, that's not so much schedule A, that's still part of that first bit saying, what lots are caught by this body corp or caught in this body corporate. Yeah. Now we get into Schedule A, and here's, I suppose, Chris, where the fights start. Yes. So um, Queensland has a bit of a unique system where we've got two lot entitlement schedules. But of course, the big thing in bodies corporates, from my perspective, is what you're spending and what your voting rights are. And those things are dictated by what's in Schedule A for your lot. So again, the same as all of our lot on title, all of our lots are gonna be described in this same schedule. And you'll see each of them has a contribution schedule lot entitlement on the left and an interest schedule lot entitlement on the right. So the interest schedule lot entitlement, in theory, should be the market value of that lot relative to all of the other lots in the scheme. And yep. you'll see down the bottom right hand side of this particular schedule, we've got a whole bunch of interest schedule lot entitlements of 400 and 500 and all that sort of thing, which is fine. And there's one down the bottom there, which has an entitlement of 167,000. <laughs> so to me, uh, that's either a big, big typographical error or it's reflective of, and this is the reality of this position, it's reflective of a lot that is a big lot of vacant land that is going to be further subdivided into other lots. Right. So Makes sense. Yeah, so that's what that says to me. And when you come across to the contribution schedule lot entitlements, you'll again see, you know, 10s and 20s and whatever it might be. And that same lot with the massive interest schedule lot entitlement has a whopping contribution schedule lot entitlement, um, which means they're going to be paying more levies. But that's also reflective of the fact that at some stage, that will probably be divvied down into who knows 15 odd lots and, and away they go the entitlements will come up roughly equal and frank, now, frank it's it's good to know isn't it that that contribution uh column that's what determines how much you'll pay in levies because uh, when the budget typically what happens when the budget is struck uh the levies are struck in such a way that uh, and correct me if i'm wrong uh, an amount of money is set as each uh entitlement and yep. so then you multiply that amount of money by however many of those entitlements you have. And that Correct. is your levy. And that's really the only way to do it when you've got a bunch of entitlements that might be 10, 12, 15, 20. If everyone was an entitlement of one, 
fine. Mm. You can just you can just levy per unit, but that's not what happens in bigger bodies corporate. So these entitlements are your proportionate share of body corporate expenses and the interest schedule lot entitlement in theory is if the body corporate got blown up and all you had was a vacant block of land, that's your proportionate <laughs> share of the value of that vacant block. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so they're pretty important things. And then and that that um, rolls onto the next page and the next page, which has um, continuing entitlements. And when you come to the last page of this, so if we go one more, one of the things that's really important to note, so you'll see the totals. See, we've got the interest schedules, you know, is up in the 200,000s. The contribution schedules is in the 3,000s. They don't need to be the same numbers. And in theory, <coughs> and the reality is they probably shouldn't be because the interest value of the, sorry, the, the relative values of the lots is not going to be the same as what the voting entitlements or the contributions toward levies might be. And again, yeah. when so Chris, we're actually, you know, again, I could be here for hours talking about this, so I'll smash through this a little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, underneath Schedule A there, we've got the basis for the calculation of the lot entitlements. So that's what's required to go into new CMSs these days. So there's a couple of different rationales for calculating lot entitlements, equality principle, relativity principle, market value principle. Those need to be stated there. And then once you've done that, you hop into Schedule B. So that's the entitlements bit. So you'll see the bottom of this page is talking about Schedule B. And Schedule B deals with further progressive development of the scheme land. So those lots that I mentioned that have the very big entitlements, Schedule B, when you roll from the top of it there onto the next page, you'll find that that describes how those vacant lots will be further developed. Right. What can, yeah, what can and can't be done. And so from a DIPA's perspective, if it's described in Schedule B, the committee can, and probably there's a good argument, must consent to whatever development's going on in accordance with whatever's described there. Right, okay. And okay. the counter argument to that, which is a really important thing, is if someone's asking for some further development that isn't described in Schedule B, then the committee can't consent to it. It's got to go to general meeting. So, right. so what you'll find, Schedule B, you're going to see in, 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 in developments that are usually flat land, usually continuing subdivisions, uh, vacant land built in stages, all that sort of stuff. You very rarely see them in a high rise and you won't see them in existing buildings where all of the development has been done. So at some stage, this body corporate, the development would all be washed through and that Schedule B will say nothing. There's to be no further development of the scheme land. Gosh. So, yeah, so I think the, the rules for that particular fight club is you can never <laughs> take for granted what you're being asked to do from a body corporate perspective is right. And from a developer's perspective, you need to make sure that if you're asking for a body corporate to do something, it's described or could be characterised in there. Because if not, there's potentially going to be trouble. Yeah, okay. So oh, okay. then, yeah, so that, that's interesting, um, Schedule B, but probably not many bodies corporates with that around, vast majority wouldn't. Then we keep rolling forward and we're into the actual bylaws. So Schedule C is where all of the bylaws are created. Um, and I'm not going to talk about, you know, we've, I suppose we've done 40 million webinars on those, yeah. Chris, um, yeah. but probably if we go through to the next page, the one bylaw that I probably want to have people have a look at is the exclusive use one there. So... Inside a body corporate, we've got lots in common property. Lot is yours. It's on your title. Happy days. Common property is everyone's and everyone's right to use unless it's being given away um, in some form of bylaw by way of exclusive use, which is what has happened here. Yeah. So this body corporate has a bunch of exclusive use bylaws. And the first part of a valid exclusive use bylaw is you actually need a bylaw because there's two parts to an exclusive use allocation. The first is the bylaw granting it. The second is an allocation of that particular area of common property in Schedule E. But you can't have one. One without the other is no good. So an allocation in Schedule E without a bylaw doesn't do anything. And a bylaw without an allocation in Schedule E doesn't actually allocate anything. So probably that's the first little bit of this in terms of the bylaws. And that's all I really talk about in terms of bylaws. If we keep scrolling through, that Schedule C will have done. Schedule D, um, which is the next page, is really 
the um, and you'll see it, it's a bit of a catch-all, other details or requirements to be included. And this, more than anything else, is architectural codes. This is the fun one, isn't it, Frank? It is, and this is really off the grid in a sense because the Act doesn't really deal specifically with it. The Act puts a whole bunch of restrictions on bylaws. It doesn't put a whole bunch of restrictions on what can go in Schedule D. So this is where a developer, usually in a flatland estate, um, can impose some rules and regulations around what's going to be built, how it's going to be built, setbacks, all that sort of stuff on top of whatever the local authority might have. So you're never going to, again, you're very light and likely to see it in a high rise. You will see it in this sort of a state where people are building their own houses as they go. Um, and again, those rules are a bit like what's in Schedule B with us talking about further development. There is no standard set of rules. It's up to what the developer has come up with. So if you are in one of these buildings that has something in Schedule D, and you want to do some works. It's a matter of understanding what's in there because there even can be in the bylaws and what's in Schedule D. Uh, and, and that, and that, and that means, Frank, sorry, I'm probably preempting your next statement. You go. No, I was going to say that means carnage. Hmm. Hmm. I was simply going to say it is the Schedule D which allows for a body corporate to actually um, have a financial penalty, or not a financial penalty, but uh, uh, levy a financial requirement against the yes. owner, isn't it? Yes, because our bylaws can't impose monetary liabilities, but um, covenants in Schedule D can. Hmm. So this so, is where bonds can be asked for legitimately. Yes. Yes, and so, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you that have listened through to this stage, that is something <laughs> that not many people know. Hmm. That is extraordinary. So probably the last thing I'd want to talk about here, if we scroll forward a page or two, is going to be, that's, here it is. Um, here is, no, probably keep going one more page, I think. And a couple more. So this is what we're talking about. The very last page I'd like to go to. Thanks, Annie. So Annie's scrolling this behind the scenes. Um, and here is that exclusive use table I was talking about, Schedule E. So this is where, the individual lots are allocated a particular area and for a particular purpose. So there we've got the bylaw, we've got the schedule, and then the third thing, or the very last thing, which I won't go into here, is there's another, at the back of this document, the back of the CMS, there's a plan that has that area on it. So when it says you're getting area 3751A on plan A, you've got a bylaw that grants it, it's showing there in schedule E, and then there's a plan that identifies it. So collectively, that is where you pick up your rights to use exclusive use and identify what they are. Wow. So I suppose, yeah, that's the whistle stop tour of what is in and reading a CMS. So maybe that might have gone that well if you weren't, if you if you are walking the dog and washing the dishes at the same time. <laughs> if that's the case. I apologise for that. Um, but it, in terms of sitting there and scrolling through what's in them, hopefully that helps people if they're not sure where they're looking for or what they're looking for. Yeah, I, I reckon it warrants a second whether listen or watch at some point for mm -hmm. people who are interested. There's a fair bit of detail to take in there. Yep. So, Christopher, best breakfast. So, we are magically reappearing on the screen. Um, I'll, I'll wait for us to dissolve. Oh, there we or, are. Not dissolve, resolve back on the screen. <laughs> Um, a really simple best practice tip, I think, on CMS is because you've had a lot of detail. It was reasonably intensive, but the simplest tip that we're going to give today is make sure you're dealing with the right CMS, um, the current CMS, the one that actually matters. Um, I've certainly seen, I'm sure you have, Frank, scenarios where somebody, usually it's the committee, saying, oh, this is the CMS. It's not the CMS at all. Um, it's what they think is the CMS. So, Frank, it's true, isn't it? only the thing that is registered with the registrar of titles is the CMS. Absolutely. Not the copy that came from the body corporate manager or the lawyer's records or even the seller gave you. It's that, that registration. Not that. And, and so if you are concerned about that, the one surefire way that will always be open to you to know which one applies, go direct to the titles office yourself and get it. That will be the one. Uh, we have a question. That's a really good question there, mm. Frank, from Steve. Does the CMS, thanks, Steve. Does the CMS indicate what plan the lots are created under? No. And I can tell you I've lost count of 
the number of people that have become confused between a CMS that refers to the standard module, comparing that to mm. a, thinking that the lots in it are created under the standard format plan. That's not the case. Mm. So the only way to tell which way um, lots were created is to get a copy of the plan. And in the bottom right hand corner, if they've got an S, if they're a BUP, it's building format. If they're a GTP, it's group title format. But all new plans these days are going to be SPs. And in the bottom right hand corner of every survey plan, SP, is the plan format it was created under. That is the only way to know. Mm. So it's not on the title reference anymore or the title description, which is what it used to be. So really, excellent question. Yeah, really good question, Steve. Thank you for that. Um, time to sum up on that note. Uh, that's all the time we have today. I mean, probably could have gone through that a whole lot more, Frank. There's a lot there. So mm. make sure you fire your questions through everyone about uh, CMSs. Um, that might uh, cause a follow-up. Uh, you can find the links that we've mentioned at hindslegal.com.au or uh, on YouTube. You can find me, uh, Chris Irons, that is, at stratasolve.com.au and Frank Higginson at hindslegal.com.au. Hope you've enjoyed our attempt at show and tell, everybody, or, or listen and tell, as the case may be. Um, until next time, Frank, get better. Chris, and, and yes, so two things. I'd say we could have a really, really, really interesting webinar next week so i'm just going to say nothing more than that um and steve if you want to send me an email i'll send you a copy of a plan and just point out where the, where to look so um yes thank you everyone stay tuned thanks everyone bye bye